Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Blythe Thomas, Chief Strategy Officer at 1000 Days. We're coming together in partnership with our colleagues of Bread for the World and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs to discuss the newest data that predicts that the most severe cases of malnutrition could affect an additional 6.7 million children in 2020. Combined with decreased coverage of life-saving nutrition interventions, this increase in wasting could mean an additional 130,000 children will die this year. To ground us, that's the equivalent of filling every seat in the largest stadium in the world. While the latest report is focused on the most severe cases, we know too the consequences of long-term effects that will change the course of lives for babies, children, and families. As you'll hear from the panelists today, we must acknowledge these first predictions about mortality, but we can and must do better than simply help children survive a crisis. The issues are complex and will require us to communicate with a unified voice and perhaps come together in new ways than before. Today, we will unpack some of this data and hear firsthand about the impacts in parts of the world like India and Ethiopia, and we'll dedicate some time to talk about solutions. The first portion of this webinar has been pre-recorded, and then the panelists will be available live to answer questions later in the call. Please be sure to tee up questions through the chat, and my colleague, Asma Latif from Bread for the World, will join me during the live Q&A portion. Let's get started. First, I'll introduce the panelists. Purnima Menon, Senior Research Fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, who is a core member of the Standing Together for Nutrition Coalition and studying program adaptations in the context of this pandemic. Dr. Mezaret Dalalam, Director of Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition at the Federal Health Ministry of Ethiopia. And Roger Thoreau, Senior Fellow on Global Food and Agriculture at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs as well as a noted author and former Wall Street Journal reporter. Purnima, there have been a number of recent papers about the impacts of COVID-19 on global health and development. Tell us why you believe this piece of research is so important. In my view, there's, uh, there's a couple of things going on here. Firstly, we've learned, we learned a lot from, from uh, previous economic crises or food price crises on how nutrition is affected. And what we have here is sort of this unprecedented coming together of a whole range of systems that affect nutrition being disrupted either by the pandemic directly or um, by the fallout of you know what governments are having to do to control the pandemic it's not just the food price crisis or just one economic crisis it's actually a, a whole sort of system level crisis where social systems have been disrupted employment has been disrupted food systems are being disrupted health systems have been utterly disrupted. So I think, you know, what we are most concerned about here, uh, this is what the, the models and the, the predictions are, in a sense, are articulating our concerns as a global community, that the extent of disruption uh, that we are seeing in these systems is going to unleash changes in, in what we know are drivers of malnutrition. When job losses or when an economic crisis hits, there are immediate sort of food security impacts for families. We know that when education is affected, there are implications for you know, early marriage. We know when health systems are disrupted, you know, there are implications for how mothers and babies receive essential health and nutrition services. In a sense, what we have is just this un, really unprecedented coming together of a series of different pathways that, in a sense, disrupt and, and change, not necessarily in positive ways, all of the things that we know are drivers of malnutrition. And so it's based on this that we are saying that we can anticipate a malnutrition crisis. I mean, we see this in normal circumstances in many, many countries, you know, where you have seasonal effects on labor, on migration, or seasonal effects on food insecurity, and you see these impacts on wasting. But what we are seeing here is a crisis that's much bigger than that. So um, it's, it's about understanding that we are likely to see these big impacts on wasting that are coming not just from health system changes, but from sort of economy-wide changes that affect very basic things such as food availability and food security for families. And so that's what we mean when we say secondary effects, is that right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. When we think about what a large problem this is at 1000 Days and our friends at Bread for the World, um, we are really focused 
also on nutrition services and nutrition interventions. Can you share a little bit how you feel that nutrition could be central to the response to this pandemic, and especially the importance of nutrition services as we work to prevent an increase in malnutrition? We live in a bit of a, in a fortunate time for nutrition. So what we have at this point in time is we have pretty significant global consensus on the importance of malnutrition. We have many countries that have signed on to major global commitments that have launched uh, major national programs. And in big countries, like India and Ethiopia and Nigeria, you even have subnational governments that have launched these big efforts to support and protect nutrition services, because we know that is such a tremendous investment in the future of societies. And what is happening now with the pandemic is uh, that many of these services are being disrupted. What we are calling for is for really serious efforts to take a look at what's going on with these services, to find creative uh, ways to adapt to the, to the distancing and the protection norms that need to be put in place um, around the pandemic, and make sure that women and babies get these services. In India alone, over 75,000 babies are born a day. That's a very large number of babies and their mothers who uh, you know, may not receive services if we don't pay attention to what's actually going on with the delivery of these, uh, these interventions. It's a really important moment. Many of us came together around sort of the calls to action for nutrition over the last decade. A lot of change has happened in many countries. We just can't afford any backsliding. You know, we can't afford to lose momentum and, and to not have these evidence-based interventions that, you know, have been part of national programs for, for a while now. Uh, be delivered to these women and babies. I think we're making sort of this all out call to say, let's really understand what's going on with these nutrition services, because what we do today is not just about the pandemic. It's also about building human capital for every baby that's born today, that's born this year. We don't want to say we failed the babies of 2020. We really don't. I don't think we could forgive ourselves if, if we did that as, as a community. There are two commentary pieces that have come out, and one of them is from four UN agency heads, and they are recommending multiple, about four interventions, actually, and those include things like vitamin A and breastfeeding. Um, can you share just a bit your perspective on what are some critical things that the global community and all of us, all the donor countries, et cetera, must do to help sort of solve this crisis now and into the future? There's two things. Firstly, I think that's an interesting package of interventions that's been costed you know, around this, this ask uh, that's being made uh, because it includes a set of preventive interventions uh, and it also includes a set of life-saving interventions. And in my view, both are really important for countries to pay attention to because on, on the one hand, with this predictions of increased wasting, you want to make sure that in countries and in situations where children who are wasted are at high risk of, of mortality, you want to make sure that you know, we have life-saving interventions in place. But there's also preventive interventions in there, and we also want to make sure that those preventive inter interventions that deliver the, the human capital uh, goals, if you will, uh, outcomes, that those are preserved. It's useful for us to think about the, you know, these interventions. The financing needs to be in place. Uh, in many countries, of course, you know, health budgets are being affected by the pandemic. Uh, it's possible that nutrition development assistance is being affected because countries that typically provide development assistance are redirecting some of their own development assistance to say base health systems responses just to deal with the, the pandemic. Um, but the other part of it is also looking at, you know, are we supporting the systems that you know can deliver these interventions? I mean, remember, it's not like we were able to deliver 100% of these interventions before the pandemic. And you know, what's going to be needed to support delivery during and through the period in which this pandemic uh, is unfolding is, uh, you know, we're, we're going to need sort of even more systems support. We're going to need even more innovation around the, the delivery systems. And then last but not least, I think we have to um, also, there has to be an, enough investment in reaching the clients and the consumers. I mean, convincing parents that uh, services are being delivered in ways that are safe, that will not expose them and their, their children uh, to even more 
uh, risks of infection and those kinds of things. So, so there's a lot of innovation and adaptation needs to happen around the delivery of these interventions and increasing their uptake and use in communities. So I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work to be done, a lot to be learned from. Uh, what's exciting to me, uh, sitting where I am in, in India and following what's happening in, in the South Asian region, is that it's not like these things are not happening. It's not like adaptations are not happening. Countries are trying to do their best under these trying circumstances. And so, you know, as a researcher, uh, I also think that there's a huge uh, burden on those of us who gather evidence and create knowledge to pay attention to documenting what's happening in, you know, in these, um, in the context of the adaptations, in the context of the renewed service delivery, in the context of understanding what client populations uh, need. So I think there's a role for all of us here, for the people who finance nutrition interventions, for the people who support uh, and deliver these interventions, and then for those of us who are, you know, the researchers and storytellers to, you know, to kind of make sure that we are doing our part to you know learn about them and and be able to preserve the knowledge that comes out of uh, you know how the world is tackling these important services in the context of the pandemic now i'd like to turn to dr Masaret, who joined us from her office in ethiopia to walk us through her experiences and how the government is responding to this crisis to hear about the early experiences when the pandemic was declared how is the government responding uh, in the month of March, virtually with the first case of report of COVID-19, impact of the restriction on the delivery of essential health and nutrition service and availability of nutrition food in the market, we have two types. One is uh, impact on delivery of the essential health service and nutrition, and the other thing is impact on the availability of essential foods in the market. So when we see the components in the impact on delivery of essential health service and nutrition component. Uh, there was a temporary disruption of the essential health and nutrition service, particularly uh, after in the month of the first case reported as COVID positive in our country in the month of March. There was like a, a temporary disruption of the essential health service because that is the frustration which is happening from the public and from the health professional. It's not only for Ethiopia, but the Panic is elsewhere in the globe. Uh, the first time when COVID is, is uh, reported as a pandemic. Uh, one is staple and nutrient dense food price were increasing at rate of uh, higher than it's seasonally uh, normal for the year. Reduced for animal source foods, vegetables, fruits consumption due to misconception. That was happening in the first month of the report. The third component is increased market price for the spices like garlic, ginger citrus fruit because these are there was a kind of misconception about these are this uh, uh, spicy uh, types of foods where uh, perhaps might be the treatment for covid 19 and the prevention of it that's why they were these are the the, sh the shortage was happening in the first few months of the covid report dr Mazret, thank you can you please share with us what are your top priorities right now in responding to this pandemic uh, we have many priorities uh, in the face of crisis of COVID-19. One is ensuring the health and nutrition, providing uh, facilities readiness with necessary personnel and, and equipment to provide like a 24 hour of a day, seven days of a week COVID-19 response service without interruption. The second is availing adequate infection prevention control and personal protective equipment and the preposition of essential health and nutrition commodities to prevent pipeline break. The third is implement approach to provide quality and equitable service while reducing client uh, frequent visit. And the fourth component is increasing demand for service and integrating service to avoid missed opportunity. And the fifth, but then the last point is reaching the most vulnerable and strengthening the referral linkage. So on behalf of the Federal Minister of uh, Health of Ethiopia, the Reproductive Maternal Health and Nutrition Directorate, Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this one. How is the Ethiopian government responding, especially in support of your most vulnerable community? The price is increasing as we compared with the same time last year. So that uh, this really, this is also a challenge, but the government is really to uh, try to solve this problem in a way that by just making 
availing the uh, commodities to get act to be accessed for the for the vulnerable groups and then we are also strengthening our PCNP because uh, we identified who should be in the safe training program those uh, pregnant and lactating mothers those uh, uh, families are being under fire so that we are trying to shield this uh, risky vulnerable groups the Minister of uh, Labour and Social Affairs and Minister of Health, Minister of Agriculture uh, as a national mission uh, coordination body we are trying to mitigate with this so this is the way that the government is trying to mitigate with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a strategic agenda for the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. So we are trying to do all our best at, at the federal and the sub-national, which is regional level, at the district level, at the local government level. And we are trying to also like doing very hard on the social mobilization part of the 1000 days. So the excellent platform that we have is it's also it's included in the end extension workers where this is a, an excellent platform for us to reach to the community and reach to the household so with this component we are trying to still mitigate with the first 1000 days moment but still covid-19 is impacting this one because uh, most of the health workers are assigned and they are on the rate duty of covid-19 pandemic response so this is still impacting the first 1000 days a public movement like keeping going on the uh, sustaining and uh, doing very hard on the first 1000 days because this is an excellent platform for working on the nutrition development aspect uh, than like acting on the treating on severe acute malnutrition treating on moderate acute malnutrition is it is an emergency part but before that happens the excellent one is working very hard on the first 1000 days movement one of, the, one of the platforms that we were working on it is uh, we, uh, we will celebrate the World Breastfeeding Week using all media outlets, using the national, sub-national television, using the radio platform, using the different uh, already existing platform. We will, we will certainly echo on the 1,000 days public movement at all level base. So we will still champion this one, working on 1,000 days. Unless we work on this, unless we champion on this, the ultimate problem will be treating uh, children with severe acute malnutrition, treating mothers with severe acute malnutrition. That is not acceptable in the 21st century. And COVID is impacting more on the nutrition. Working on nutrition is a primary agenda. And working on an excellent milestone, which is a 1,000 public movement, this is a key component where we would like to mitigate this COVID impact for, for nutrition. What are some innovative ways that you are addressing this crisis, especially empowering mothers and families with nutrition interventions? Now we are really trying to work very hard on the mitigation strategies of COVID-19. One segment is uh, like continuing on the health service delivery with a different modality. And the other thing is the nutrition delivery and nutrition program. So one of the exercises that we are working is the self-care, uh, the context-specific RMNC self-care is being exercised. So we have almost working on a final document. So in that component, we have also the nutrition component. So that part is we want to also recognize the engagement of mothers, uh, for example, by training mothers, like giving the mid upper circumference uh, tab measures. So we will uh, teach the mom, what does it mean if the measurement is li like lying on the green? What about it is yellow? What about it's red? When she's going to reach out the health workers, when she's going to reach out the health extension worker. So we, we, we wish to uh, input, I mean, pilot in a very, I mean, in a very fastest time. So we will learn and then exercise. This will be one of the excellent platform for us to really look into the health system uh, strengthening in light of COVID-19, which is empowering mothers, engaging mothers as a part of, like in a part of, uh, I mean, the management and the care of uh, their children. So Sometimes it can feel daunting and unreal when we talk about millions of lives lost You've seen firsthand the effects that last for an entire generation after a crisis like this. 
including the 2003 famine in Ethiopia. Tell us about Hagirso and what your fears are for Hagirso during this crisis and for Hagirsos around the world. So when I first met Hagirso during the famine in Ethiopia in 2003, it was the first great hunger crisis of the 21st uh, century. So like 14 million people were on the doorstep of starvation then in that catastrophe. And they were surviving, if they were going to survive at all, by food aid and the international food aid that was rushing into the country and being distributed by the World Food Program and a number of other agencies. And saw Hargirso in an emergency uh, feeding tent. He had just been carried there by his father several days before that we arrived and I saw him. And he was about five years old and he weighed just 27 pounds. They were telling his father, Tesfaya, that they didn't know if he was going to survive because the, the shock had been so severe. So I left that emergency feeding tent that day, and it was always in the back of my mind, well, what, whatever became of Hargirso? Did he survive? So this was now 10 years afterwards. So he was about 15 years old. And I found him, and he was with his dad and his family, uh, and still physically stunted, and that was clear. But now he was in school, he told me uh, very proudly. Uh, like in school, and his dad, he says, yeah, he's in school. Uh, was down the pathway, so we went to the school. He was just in first grade. So 15 years old, first grade, just learning his alphabet that day was the kind of the vowel consonant combination. So it was B, 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 uh, writing in his notebook for the very first time. So there one starts to see the long-term aspects of this malnutrition from the early uh, childhood days. He's still in school, hooray for that, go to his classroom. Now he's in the fourth grade. So 20, 21 years old, just in the fourth grade. Now he's learning simple math, uh, multiplication, the addition that goes with that. Half that class was, there were about 60 plus students in that fourth grade class, and there were four or five fourth grade classes in that school. It was very crowded. And they were going in shifts, morning shift, afternoon shift. And in Hargirso's fourth grade class with 60 plus students, half of them or so were 18 years old and above. and Seeing that class, there you see the long-term generational aspects of early childhood Sunday. So it was that whole cohort and cadre of, of, of children at that time in 2013 that perhaps were just in the womb of, of the mom, the mom pregnant at the time, she's not eating properly, that malnourishment then being transferred to the child. When the child is born and the breastfeeding, if the mom is still malnourished, when complementary feeding begins and there's not enough food, or even for Hargirso, who was four, five years old at the time, also then not getting uh, enough food and the access to the food and the nutrition. Here one sees that consequence all that time later. And so then as the pandemic hits, I'm thinking that that, that classroom, that fourth grade classroom in the Bericha Plateau of Ethiopia, and looking in there and seeing all these young adults that are in the fourth grade, that then is this long-term impact that now the, the UN agency leaders uh, and, and others are, wor are warning about that if this pandemic and we allow it to become this full-blown nutrition crisis and food crisis, as we're already seeing uh, happening, that will have these then long-term impacts and the most pernicious impact and what will carry this pandemic and the coronavirus, the impact far into the future then is this malnutrition. But that one measurement that's, that, that is, 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 is hard to quantify and almost impossible to measure is this loss of human potential and this, this, this life sentence of underachievement and underperformance. So looking into that fourth grade classroom with more than half the students in there, advanced teenagers or young adults, wow, that's kind of a really scary picture of the future that if we don't get on top of this nutrition crisis that comes out of the pandemic, uh, that's the most pernicious in the long-term impact. Thank you so much, Roger. Tell us about your new storytelling project that you're launching today, in fact. Through my work at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, we're launching a new feature called The First Thousand Days and Beyond on the Front Lines of Childhood Malnutrition, which is an interactive storytelling project that follows the triumphs and tragedies of mothers and their children battling nutrition from pregnancy to age two and beyond. It is a rare look at their journeys over nearly a decade. I first met these three families in India, Uganda, and Guatemala while writing my most recent book, The First Thousand Days. One of the moms, Brenda from Uganda, lost her first child before he was two weeks old. After that, through nutrition education and support, she began growing two nutritious crops, 
vitamin A enriched orange sweet potatoes, and iron rich beans with the help of Harvest Plus and World Vision. During her second pregnancy, she ate those crops that she grew herself. And when her son, Aaron, was born, relatives and neighbors admired his robust and sturdy size. Aaron has thrived on his mother's nutrient-rich breast milk and eventually those same sweet potatoes and beans. An example of what good nutrition and support systems can do to change a life, a family, and entire communities. This is why it's not just important to survive, but to also thrive with the nutritious food and support necessary to live the full, healthy lives these children deserve. Excellent. At this time, I would like to ask if um, my panelists could please all turn on your webcam and your phone and your, uh, excuse me, your microphones so that we can begin. We also have um, a question box and encourage all of you to be asking questions. I'd like to introduce my colleague Asma Latif from Bread for the World, who also will be um, co-leading this dialogue. And um, Asma, I might um, at the very end of this show my screen one more time to make sure that Roger's final response um, to that question was answered. I'm monitoring different screens and I want to make sure that there wasn't a lag in the video and the live. So thanks in advance. Please go ahead and take us away. Thanks very much, Blythe. And um, thank you all for joining um, on this incredibly important topic and the new data and modeling. It's uh, really ama amazing to hear your perspective. I'd like to start with Dr. Meseret. Um, you were talking about your uh, the prioritization of nutrition in the immediate response. How does the modeling that uh, that uh, we we have in the Lancet recently help make the case internally for you um, within the government to prioritize nutrition? H how important is having this data available to you? Thank you very much indeed once again. Uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, for this platform. Uh, data is really, I can say, the backbone for everything. So uh, having the data is really uh, important for, for our next action. So when we see the data, uh, it's really good to triangulate. When you have some modeling, uh, good to have like a base of uh, like information. Uh, primary, secondary information has to be triangulated. Like, uh, for example, we had that, like, we have every five years the Ethiopian Demographic Health Survey, every five years. So the, the last has been done in 2016. And we have also the mini DHS, Ethiopian Demographic Health Survey, which has been conducted uh, in, at the end of 2019. So it's good to see the such a data for a triangulation. So we have seen the modeling. Uh, it's still good to look into in depth uh, with the available data, particularly for the Ethiopian status. So I could say we definitely demand data because the data is really very important for action. So unless we use that data for action, it will be really nonsense. So we need to act in a timely manner using the data at hand. So we really can't wait to see the final data for our next action. So this is what I would like to say about the data and the what's the relevance of data. Thank you. Thank you. When am I, if you were listening to Dr. Nasret talk about the response that the Ethiopian government has um, taken in response to the COVID crisis and prevent, trying very hard to prevent uh, a malnutrition crisis, how does that resonate from what you're hearing from other governments and some of the challenges and opportunities you see as governments are responding? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, like I mentioned in the um, in the recorded section as well, um, one of the things that we saw this time was that malnutrition, because it was already uh, fairly high on the agendas of many of the, the governments that we've been working with and supporting, um it it wasn't like a you know obviously some things will fall off the radar for a little while but it's not like it um it, you know it went completely off the agenda so i think we've definitely seen that 
um, you know, as Dr. Mestre had said, you know, counterparts that I'm in touch with in in uh, in India and and in different states across India are definitely thinking about how do we preserve and bring back these nutrition services. Uh, the challenges are tremendous. The pandemic, you know, is is sort of still uh, rolling through many of these countries, and so I I think there's going to need to be uh, continuous. Uh, advocacy, but also what we know is that there is continuous program adaptation that is happening, you know, both by the health workers themselves on the ground because they know they need to deliver these nutrition services. It's become part of what they do every day. Um, and so I think even on the ground, they're thinking about how to get things done. Um, so I think what, you know, if I reflect on, on India very briefly, um, the sort of core lockdown period was probably the, the most challenging period for service delivery but since then you know as things have started to open up certainly uh, many of these services have started to come back on on and uh, the nutrition services were recognized as essential services and that um, actually was very heartening you know that was heartening how we get it done is uh, and and you know how well that goes and and you know how many people are missed those are still big questions, but the fact that it didn't completely fall off the policy radar is uh, good news. Is that <laughs> we'll new? take what we get on the good news front, right? <laughs> is that sort of a new thing that be, that it's being recognised as essential? Um, not really. No, I, you know, the in in India, the national nutrition mission was sort of at peak implementation, um, just you know, in the period just before the pandemic. So it was pretty high on the policy agenda and on the implementation agenda. Um, I, you know, I don't know what that would be like or what things would have been like if it weren't already highly, it, it, if it weren't already such a salient issue. Um, but it's not just the nutrition services. You know, I think we are, as the modeling says, we're very concerned about the economic pathways and the indirect pathways. And some of those are much harder to bring uh, you know, to sort of resuscitate, if, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps other uh, additional point is uh, we have also DHIS2. You know DHIS2. Ethiopia has already rolled out DHIS2 since January 2018. So we trace very important milestone components of the nutrition. So uh, we trace every month's growth monitoring and promotion. So it's very good to see the HIS2 and then EDHS, uh, the most recent one, uh, this triangulation is really important. That's the that wish to add to us on top of the point. Thank you. Raja, with the data that's um, in the Lancet with um, the COVID crisis, how do, how do you think we, we as a community can help really change the narrative on nutrition, looking ahead to some of the important opportunities next year. How will this modeling, um, the call to action by the heads of UN agencies, really um, help change the narrative, build momentum? Hey, Asma, yeah, thank you. And great to be with everybody. And thanks for everybody attending and listening in. Uh, I think it's tremendously powerful. Uh, and and very helpful. Uh, these numbers, uh, they have, they convey this urgency, this immediacy uh, that we need to do this now to to be on top of this. All these numbers are lives, uh, they're people, uh, their voices, their emotions, and so if we can capture that uh, and say and say this is what at stake. I mean, Pernimer said something really um, interesting uh, and important earlier that we can't fail the babies, the moms. We can't fail the babies of 2020, because if we fail these babies of 2020, this is the impact that we're going to see on the children of 2030, you know, when they're 10 years old, of the teenagers, then in 2035, of the young adults in 2040, and then as adults kind of throughout life. This impact, failure today, and, 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 and this urgency that's conveyed by these numbers and the call to action, the, the, the leaders of the UN organizations and that's put forward by the Lancet and is coming through in this webinar. I hope uh, this is this, this, this really important for taking care of this harbinger uh, of the future uh, that we see. 
And that was so impactful then, as I, as I had spoken about, this, this fourth grade classroom in Ethiopia that I had visited in December, uh, right before the explosion of, of, of COVID. And there you could really see that to me was this glimpse then into the, into the future because the malnourished and stunted children from the Ethiopian famine of 2003, that's what one was seeing there. This life sentence of underachievement and underperformance that then carries through life and then becomes this, this generational aspect. So that in that fourth grade classroom, half the class of 60 plus students were 18 years old and above all their dreams and aspirations, they become stunted along with the bodies and along with the cognitive mind. And just think of the lost opportunity and potential for all of us. What might those children have accomplished not only for their families, but for their community, for Ethiopia as a whole, for Africa, for the world as a whole, for all of us, what might they have accomplished were they not uh, malnourished and stunted as, as children? That's what we're looking for with these, if we fail the babies of 2020, as Pernima says, that's, that's what we're gonna find out. And this lost chance of greatness for any one child, because we who knows what they might accomplish, this lost chance of greatness for one child becomes this lost chance for all of us. And that is profound uh, when you think about it. And that's that I think is what is, can help the narrative storytelling of that's what these numbers show, that's what this warning and this call to action is. It's an immediacy, but it's also the future and the damage that it can be done through that. Thank you, Raja. Blythe, Blythe is say, saying that there are a couple of questions in the chat. So, Blythe, go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Um, Eric has asked, relative to food systems disruptions, how extensively has the pandemic affected basic health services, such as vaccinations and supplementation? And how has this been accounted for in projections of impact in infant and child morbidity and mortality and the burden therefrom? Bonima, do you want to start on that? Um, so I, I, I think one of the challenges right now is that we, we just, you know, we, we have predictions, um, but we don't have a lot of data from the ground as to, as to what's actually happening and how this is, this is unfolding. Uh, we are starting to see some of that. Um, but I, you know, I, and I think this is this is where I, I called for as as a researcher for investments that move alongside it. Um, the the modeling um, calls us to action because it signals that you know things have a very strong likelihood, you know, based on things that we've learned before of not going well. Um, but we do need more information and data from the ground to see, you know, are things even worse than that they could be we just don't know are things better than that that would be great right um but i i i'm really struck by you know how really in the last six months of the pandemic unfolding we've been working with a lot of lot of modeled uh data which is spurring us to action but i i'm you know really wondering what is actually going on in, in people's lives. How are moms really doing? What services are they really getting? How many kids really miss their immunizations? Um, you know, how many women or children are, you know, going to bed hungry or whatever. Like I, I feel a sense of urgency that we need to know that for real. Uh, because that also needs to spur us to action. <laughs> Dr. Messerit, do you have a sense of, of how that's unfolding in Ethiopia? Are children missing their um, vaccinations? And are you are you getting some of that real-time data that Purnima was asking Thank for? Thank you very much. In fact, uh, immediately after the first COVID uh, the patient reporting in Ethiopia in the month of March 2020, we have been working on uh, virtually with the COVID mitigation strategy to sustain the and continuation of the essential health services and among others, protecting the most vulnerable groups. I can say mothers, children, adolescents and youth has to be uh, getting the critical services so that we, we, we worked out with the very important strategy for the continuation of uh, essential health component the productive health, maternal health, newborn child health, and immunization, nutrition service, as well as the prevention of mother to child uh, HIV transmission, 
and uh, the other component is the uh, all service for maternal and child health adolescent youth health is in place so we are tracking every week the is important components uh, we selected a very priority milestone one is uh, weekly uh, collecting the data of the maternal mortality so we survey every week the maternal uh, mortality peak perinatal mortality the severe acute malnutrition case in place for the treatment is being tracked and then we were also tracing the outbreak for vaccine preventable disease so we uh, usually see every we every week uh, see this data and we act accordingly and the recent memory that we have is Ethiopia I can say uh, boldly Ethiopia is the first country who has conducted hugely massively reaching uh, uh, nine months to 59 months campaign for measles uh, supplementary immunization assay. I can say this is the first in the world which we have successfully achieved reaching close to 15 million children, nine months to uh, 59 months. You can see even in the press release from the WHO Afro, Gavi also recognized that effort. So I could say, despite the COVID challenge, despite all the challenges we have, we are trying to boldly mitigate all this problem following COVID. So immunization is in place, the child health is in place, and then even we did the preventive supplementary immunization campaign for visits. Uh, and then it has been started on June 30, and it was uh, ended in July 8, 2020, for most regions uh, where the peace is in place. But in Addis, in, in Oromia, some part of Oromia and Harare, uh, you have been, I mean, remember, there was really a tragic story we had because we have missed our uh, brother, the uh, famous uh, singer. And then following that, uh, there was a critical problem. Then immediately after that, we were conducting that immunization and we are really successfully uh, reaching close to 15 million children. And literally speaking, we have reached 14 uh, million, uh, 14.6 million children. I can say 96% successful story of the measles immunization. Now, we are also uh, tracking the day child to data every month and then we see the trend. So we have been, we, we saw the trend and then there was a decline in some components of uh, maternal and child health in the months of um, April and then March and April because there was a public panic. But now it is really increasing, The it is raising up uh, as of May uh, 2020, because we are working very hard on a balanced social mobilization. In the right hand, is a non-essential uh, COVID functions, vital functions to get in place. And, and then in the left side, I can say COVID prevention and control. So that we are working very hard on these two biggest assignments. So that's why we are, uh, I, I can say COVID really yes. essential. Hey, Asma. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that we know that that's all uh, uh, kind of really fabulous and important for everybody to understand because we know it both net numbers and data wise in the practice that Dr. Messer is talking about, but we also know it and, and we see it anecdotally that all these other all these these other programs and the vaccinations and the the supplemental uh, the vitamin A uh, distribution which we saw in some of the background footage. Uh, we see how all important that is in supporting these nutrition efforts. And without them, all these wonderful nutrition efforts that are, are, are undermined um, and, and the impact and the benefit then is, is lost. And hopefully that comes through also in this thousand days and beyond interactive storytelling that we see that with each of the moms that all these other factors that are going on in their lives. Yes, nutrition is so important and essential in the center of it, but it's all these other aspects that then uh, really uh, bolster and underpin those nutritional uh, efforts. So the whole house and construction of this then starts to be undermined and weakened and collapse uh, with something like this. Yeah. yeah. Like, did, was there another question? There is, thank you. So another one says, are you implementing nurturing care activities with parents for infant and child stimulation? If not, why? Or if yes, tell us a little more about what you might be doing. I assume that's for you, Dr. Messer. Pardon me, please. So, Dr. Messer, the question, 
um, was about nurturing care for mothers and infants. Um, Are you implementing those programs now? You want to go further on that? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not an implementer, but I've been hearing some really, we are, we're doing uh, some research, beginning some research on uh, adaptations, and we've been hearing some, you know, really fascinating stories anecdotally, which we are trying to now build some data around of um, health workers doing, uh, using smartphones to do video-based counseling of of mothers on breastfeeding and infant feeding and things like that now of course you know those uh, so there's a lot of really interesting things that one is seeing around these program adaptations um but we are trying to you know also do some um do some data collection around that to learn how widespread some of that is and and whether things like technology are enabling you know health workers to deliver what are their you know, typically the kinds of interventions that they deliver in the context of, of nurturing care, which is counseling and, and support to, uh, to mothers and, and babies. Um, so that's, you know, just, just one example of what we've been hearing about and are, are, are looking to, to kind of pull together more around. Dr. Matra, did you want to come in on that? Yeah. Thank you once again. Uh, we are also, uh, we have also a very good, uh, uh, a focus agenda in the in our ministry, uh, early childhood development. That's a part of uh, nurture, nurturing. Uh, the previous thought was like uh, uh, survival of the infant and newborn and thriving. Now the next, the third component is transforming the generation. So the most important uh, exercise that we are using is the uh, early childhood development. So. We are using the, using this chance. Uh, we are working on nurturing. Great, thank you. Blythe, were there other questions or? There are. So there are some questions about implementing, which I'm sensitive to because I know we've especially brought forward um, Pranima with her research experience, Dr. Messerat, and certainly Roger and his storytelling. Um, there's a new question that came in that says. The road to 2025 and 2030 is now more challenging, but the adaptations that are taking place, what is rising up as effective, Pranima addressed it. Are there new ways that sectors could be working together, particularly how humanitarian programs can better integrate nutrition? And Asma, mm -hmm. you should feel free to answer that question too, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. Pranima, do you want to go first? Well, you know, I, I'm thinking of this whole issue of um, multi-sectoral collaboration and, and convergence and, and what it means. And in, in too much of the work in the past, it has meant people sitting around a table and trying to figure out, you know, what we can do. Um, and it has, it, it, it has, I think, not had a sense of urgency um, because I don't think we have ever encountered a situation like this where all those sectors actually have all been impacted um, but the ways in which they've been impacted in the end sort of come and focus in you know as roger said it's like uh, the house the food the the water the the jobs the health services all of them kind of come in and focus on these women and children living in these homes and so now i feel there's you know there is just this terrible sense of urgency to say, you know, those systems have been disrupted. Uh, we really need to get them all back together. And maybe one of the things that can come out of this is to say, you know, what matters most is that all these systems and all these interventions converge uh, quickly and effectively on these households. So it's less about us talking to each other and more, of, more about all the sectors just saying, you know, we recognize that in these geographies, in these places, these homes, people living in these communities are affected and that all that work and all the support and the interventions converge where they need to um, on these uh, women and, and children and the homes that they, they live in. So, uh, you know, if we can bring some urgency to, you know, to the idea and, and to the actions that support and speak to this issue of the disruption of multiple systems, 
uh, then I think we would have done the field uh, a service. Um, you know, I, I think health services will likely be able to come back. I worry much, much more about what's happening uh, with people in, um, you know, in the context of lost jobs and lost incomes and, and increases in, in poverty, sort of changing economies around bringing jobs back online. These are the things that will, um, you know, will take, a, take some tremendous efforts. Um, and in the interim, you're going to have to support families with food security assistance and, and cash assistance um, and things like that. And they have to converge. They have to reach those thousand day families. There is no other way this is going to work out for those kids. Right. Yes, go ahead. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, this is also a critical component. So the most important part here is working very hard on event sectoral fashion. So one of the very important showcases in Ethiopia is working uh, collaboratively in a mid sector for a productive safety net program. So this is a very good example, uh, which the health sector, agriculture and the social sector is uh, working very hard and co-designing together. So this is the excellent platform where we can shield the most vulnerable women, pregnant mothers, lactating mothers in under five. So, uh, this is a way that we can really integrate the humanitarian into the development aspect, not to left like the most vulnerable behind and get devastated with the expected severe acute humanitarian. So this is one of the showcases I could say on the productive safety net program, which really a core element to much sectoral uh, the working health, agriculture, and social aspect. Yep, and regarding this convergence, I would say. And the urgency that Purnima and, and the doctor uh, uh, referenced to, if not now, when? So there's been all this talk, as Purnima says, if we're not gonna recognize and, and this need and this urgency for this convergence and everything coming together now, because it certainly does in the lives of all these moms and children and families, if we don't recognize and, and, and do that now, then when will that ever happen? This is, this is the, the, the moment of, uh, of movement on this. There's a, uh, a whole, uh, more more data coming out about um, the marginalization of women, violence against women. Um, how are um, how what efforts are underway to to make sure that women are being reached and that they are getting the services that they need because of lockdown, because of the whole change changing dynamic. Um, how what extra efforts have to be taken to make sure that women are actually being reached and not being left behind for so, so much so much you know I, I like i said i i think this is a systems level disruption like nothing we have ever seen before and um the the stories the data the insights that are coming out around what's happening to women both in terms of you know their own engagement with the economy and losses there but also what's happening to them in in many cases within their own homes that's a tremendous disruption of of the social system so we've talked about health economic food and social systems being disrupted um, I, I don't know what all the solutions are. There, there is certainly evidence from, you know, for example, work that IFPRI has done that cash transfers that are targeted to women um, actually have huge potential to uh, even impact and reduce uh, violence against women. So, you know, I, I think governments are going to have to move really fast to figure out, you know, for each of those systems that have been disrupted that in turn affect the lives of women and children to say what are we going to do about the disruption to the health system what are we going to do to the disruption to the food system what are we going to do about these social issues as well and how are we going to do it in ways that reach everyone but especially the most vulnerable ones together right the actions around those four sectoral disruptions have to reach families together we can't have food assistance coming now and health systems coming back online later and programs to address or support uh, women, you know, a year or two later. It has to happen now. It has to happen together. It has to happen for everyone that truly needs that. Um, yeah. Dr. Masrit, do you have yeah. something? Thank you. I think this this really demands critically a joint effort of the sector working on a woman uh, and then uh, children and youth affairs. 
social affairs, uh, labor and social affairs, uh, Minister of Justice, the health sector, even the uh, media people. So these are the, the influential I mean, sectors which really uh, advocate and reach um, in the equivalent way for the most vulnerable women. So this is a way that we can really shield this uh, vulnerable from the uh, any any kind of violence. So uh, we need to really work on the security agenda. I would say this is the security agenda. Why? Because the female or the woman should get secured uh, financially, and the health security is also the other agenda. And then the nutrition. So this all really demands the concerted effort. So I could say in in my country. Uh, these sectors are working very closely, even the media people. And we lost the signal. I think Asma might have frozen, but I do see. Oh, Asma might be back. Yes, I did. My Wi Fi was acting up. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, so th I, I'm. I think it's time to wrap up, right? Right. Yes, and Dr. Masret, thank you. I'm. I'm sorry. I know the technical difficulties. I want to thank all of you um, yeah. and turn over to Asma to wrap us up. But um, yeah. really appreciate you working through this with our technology, especially joining us from Ethiopia, from India, from our central time zone. But please, over to you, Asma. Yeah, thank you all very much. Very rich discussion, and we could go on for a long time. So, I, I seven quick takeaways, um, mindful of the time. First of all, we, the magnitude of the data, the modeling, the predictions, 10,000 deaths a month. My colleagues uh, calculated that that would be about a child every four and a half minutes. Um, this is a crisis that we really absolutely have to take seriously. I'm really struck by the, the the second point, really struck by the leadership of the government of Ethiopia on this, really focusing both on the prevention side as well as the the um, you know responding in real time to the the crisis. Um, and the third point, it's really incumbent on the international community to support government leadership. A government governments. Um, especially governments that are part of the Scaling Up Nutrition movement, are you know, dealing with um, this enormous crisis and trying not to backslide on nutrition outcomes. And so it's really important that we, that we get behind and support national leadership. The fourth point is, uh, uh, and I think Roger and Purnima, you, you made this point so effectively, that the, the forecast, these estimates, are really just the tip of the iceberg and you know the long-term consequences of missing this the window of failing the babies of 2020 will be enormous for the countries that have um that have a very high burden of malnutrition already and so we really need this is an, a crucial moment to to act and we can prevent this backsliding if we act urgently and that's that's the the call that the UN heads of UN agencies made the other day, the 2.4 billion. That's crucial to get to making sure that this backsliding um, doesn't happen. And then my two last points: next year is going to be crucial with the Nutrition for Growth Summit. It's an opportunity to learn the lessons of this crisis, as um, you know we've all been talking about the disruptions and all these sectors and systems, we need to learn those lessons and really um, make commitments at the Nutrition for Growth Summit that helps us leap for forward so that um, in 2030, we're not paying the price for having missed this opportunity. And finally, we all need to stand together for nutrition. So with that, thank you all very much. Uh, for joining today and thank you Roger, Purnima, Dr. Nasret and Life for this really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning.